Yeah, we might have to let people know that we ended that live broadcast. We're good. They'll figure it out. We got smart people. We got smart people. All right. Come on in. Come on in. Mm, 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 mm. Yes, everybody survived the snow, the snow apocalypse. So it started coming down hard last night. I was supposed to go to a birthday party at 8, and I was supposed to be on the northwest side, and I said, I can do this. I can do this. You know, I got four-wheel drive, and I literally pulled out of my neighborhood and drove up the street, didn't even make it half a block, and said, nope, not going to do it. Turned right back around, came home, and said, sorry, guys, I'm out. Um, Yeah, it was nasty there for a while. And then I woke up this morning. I had the bright idea of like shoveling my driveway last night to like get it up and off. And I, by the time I did one pass down, uh huh, yeah. So I, by the time I had one pass down, it had already filled back in. So I was like, "This is stupid. I'm not doing that." But um, yeah, other than that, it was great. Beautiful. Walked outside. It felt like it was like two o'clock in the afternoon. It was so bright. And so, so well, welcome. I'm glad you guys made it. So we'll see how I'm sure either you have people online or people just slept in. Both of those are amazing options. And so, um, but we are excited about being here today. And That being said, um, I wanted to begin, uh, we will be, I'm trying to think announcements wise, uh, small groups start next week, or yeah, this coming week. So if you are in the first group, uh, February 3rd, we'll see you at my house if you have any questions. Holler at me. I would love to give directions and we can go from there. Um, we're excited about those. We're excited about what Jesus is doing and how he's uh, building building community in, in fun ways. So I think uh, that's all the announcements that I have. Uh, that being said, as we begin this morning, I uh, wanted to do a... Uh, um, kind of a worship experience with y'all, if you don't mind. Um, I was sitting with the Lord this week, and uh, I was sitting in a coffee shop because we sold the building, <laughs> yes. This guy right here, Rob Stiles, this was, I was, I was underneath him for like, he was late. I was, uh, I was in the, say he was my pastor for seven years, and uh, this guy, I'm telling you, you want to talk about digging a well within me, a lot of uh, what I know to be true about the spiritual realm, a lot of what I know to be true about deliverance ministry, all is a byproduct of that man right there. So he mentored and trained me in a lot of that stuff. And so I'm telling you, he, uh, he looks like, you know, like a, a GQ model right now, but you get that guy, <laughs> he's the one that always just say, you got to paint the barn every once in a while. Um, but I'm telling you, you put him in a, in a deliverance session where somebody's really hurting and they're oppressed, that dude is a sword-wielding, like, Fabio, you know? He keeps his shirt on, but, you know, other than that, you know what I mean? So, it's good to see you, sir. So, that being said, um, as we're going today, I really wanted to, I was sitting in, in uh, since we've sold the building, I don't have an office, and so the coffee shop has become my office which makes intercession fascinating when the Lord drops um, because then all of a sudden like tears start to flow and then I'm not sure what to do with my hands and it just gets really uncomfortable. So I try to sit in a place where I can hide my face. Um, all of that to say, I was, uh, I was sitting in a passage of scripture um, just kind of meditating on it and I think people probably think I'm falling asleep because I have my eyes closed and I'm just like letting, the, like letting the word cut me open. And what happens though is when the word starts to cut you open and you start to hear the voice of Jesus and he starts telling you how much he loves people. Then you like open your eyes and you're in a packed coffee house. Like all I want to do is go hug people but that's frowned upon when they don't know you. You know what I mean? I don't know how to describe it. And so, Yeah. So I was reading this book and there was a line that I was, you know, I had talked about it last week, but I'm reading this book about table fellowship and what it is. And he was talking about in the Hebrew culture, this, I'm going to read a quote here. He says, the Hebrews, became, they, had come, they had become to such a place that they were able to say, to be blessed. My, our definition to be blessed is to have enough to eat and drink, to have reason to rejoice 
and exalt out of a glad heart. And as a corollary, to be cursed is to suffer hunger and thirst and to be ashamed and despair with a broken spirit. It's like simplified life. We are blessed when we have enough to eat and drink and we have reason to celebrate. And we are cursed. And I was, as I was processing this, I was like, and these aren't people that were like staying at like the, the presidential suite at the Hilton. These are people like the pinnacle of their life in the Old Testament is defined as each man had his own vine and his own fig tree. So had some type of shelter and had his own vine and his own fig tree. Like that was life in that time. And they were able to say, this is what being blessed is. And I thought, Jesus, ah, it's interesting. It's interesting. So what I want to do today, if you guys would just uh, um, go with me on this, um, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 5 today, and we're going to be working through another one of our value systems. Um, But out of the 2 Corinthians 5 passage, I want to read three verses because I feel like I want to attach like this worship experience to this. Is that okay? And so with that, um, this is 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 12. This is the real famous passage. We'll end up getting to it where he says, um, for we, you know, um, therefore from now on we regard no one according to the flesh, right? And then he goes on and he says that this is the real famous one. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so, but this is, the, this is the preamble to that, if you will. Paul's talking about his ministry. And I can't think of a better way because where we're at, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Hallelujah. Going into teaching mode. Okay. This is worship. Verse 12. He says, he's talking to the, the Corinthian people and he says, we do not commend ourselves again to you. But we give you opportunity to boast on our behalf. I just want to put it in layman's terms. He's saying, I'm not trying to impress you. We're not trying to build ourselves up like we're the ones like you guys need to be impressed with. I'm not trying to impress you with my preaching. I'm not trying to impress you with my anointing. That's not what I'm trying to do. It's almost like he's saying, I'm trying to impress you with you. That when you begin to see what Jesus feels about you, you become impressed with you, not me. And I don't mean this in a hubris way. I don't mean this in an arrogant way. I mean like, oh my gosh, that's what the Father thinks of me? We do not commend ourselves again to you, but we give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. And this is to those that when you become convinced of what Jesus is saying over you, suddenly those that are really prioritizing the external righteousness of the law Those that are really prioritizing, how do we get you to look like what we want you to look like? When you begin to talk from, I'll use this language, heart language, no, can I tell you what Jesus has done in me? Can I tell you, he's wrecked me. Like, yeah, I'm convinced that I am his beloved, and I don't even know what that means, other than the fact that I know what his eyes look like when he looks at me. It's in that moment, head language doesn't have an answer to what you're talking about. He says in verse 13, if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. And that word beside ourselves means to be caught up in mutual bliss. So think about this. Paul's whole point of salvation, this is what, remember last week we talked about being warmed by the fire is how they used to describe salvation. The whole point is is that when I get warmed up and I see the look in his eyes, I get caught in this mutual bliss where he delights in me and then I get to delight in him. And that, that reciprocal, that mutuality with Jesus of I am his beloved and he is mine. I get him. I get parts of his heart that nobody in the world gets. Paul's saying when you get caught up in that, that blissful encounter, he'll say elsewhere, that's getting drunk in the spirit. That's getting lost in his embrace. <coughs> that's engaging in the dance of romance. Some guys are like, I am uncomfortable with this. Which is fascinating because we are the bride of Christ. So it's a really interesting thing where I think a lot of guys can learn from women how to be a bride. There's something in the church where I think the women, 
incarnationally have a better language for being a disciple than we do as, as men. So it's this whole place we find ourselves in where Paul says, for if we are beside ourselves, it's because we're caught in that embrace, we're caught in that dance. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. I love this language. But when I got to lock it in because I, can, I, can, I know that your heart wants to connect and I can maybe, I'm trying to find a language for what I'm experiencing, I'm going to try to put on my sound mind hat. I'm going to try to put on my rational thoughts to help engage with you. But sometimes in the church, we've gone to a sound mind and we've lost the lover's heart. Does that make sense? And so I don't know what his eyes look like when he looks at me anymore. So he looks a lot like my theology. He looks a lot like my concepts of him. He looks a lot like the principles of this is what I need to do in order to be loved. And so as I was sitting this week, I'm sitting with the, with the Lord. And I find myself just getting lost in this embrace and this dance, which is awkward when you're in a room full of strangers. And then I felt like the Lord said this next verse, for the love of Christ compels us. And I felt like the Lord said, Matt, a lot of people are compelled by their shadow, by their anxiety. They're compelled by the things they've never looked at because they've never looked at me. I want you to be so undone in me that Christ is the one that compels you to action. Come on, you, you know what I'm talking about, these moments where you feel compelled, and I don't, even like in a negative sense, like I feel compelled to defend myself here. I feel compelled to tell them like, no, 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 that's, you know, whatever the language is. It's this driving that's in here that's beyond words. And Paul's whole point is that, no, 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 when I get caught up, when I get caught up in the lover's embrace, it somehow reframe, it, it reforms me in a way that, like love, it's the love of Christ. And then I, and then you know what happens is I fall in love with him. I mean, really fall in love. And I'm not talking how we look at like young couples in the honeymoon stage and we like giggle at them. And we go, you just wait. I believe with the Lord because this love is new every morning. It is a place of it. It's an invitation to refresh and reframe and renew that love where I'm falling in love with him. And then you know what? He's falling in love. He's telling me how much he loves me in a way that I start to fall in love with myself again. I start to see myself in ways that I've never seen myself. And now all of a sudden I'm like, I begin to taste freedom. And it's freedom from the compulsions of the shadow. And think about this, we used Peter as the illustration, the Simon Peter of the shadow. But here's the thing we didn't talk about. You know, you know Peter, who is the, has the biggest shadow of anybody in Scripture that we have, and in in, of the disciples that we see. And you know what healed people in the book of Acts? It's his shadow. It's the place when you let the Lord touch those places. I'm telling you, you get wrecked in his love. You get undone and suddenly your shadow becomes the very place that brings healing to everyone around you. Because it's not your talents and your gifts. It's the place of your brokenness. It's not about, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not doing it with the best principles. I'm just lost in love. Yeah. The love of Christ compels us. For we're convinced, we judge this. That if Christ died for, what does it say? That if one died for all, then all died. So here's some theology for you. You ready? I'm sitting in the coffee shop and the Lord says, do you believe that I died to redeem your shadow? Yeah, I do, Lord. Do you believe that my song over you is better than what you believe about yourself? Yeah, I do. Every time I talk to you, you tell me something new about me. Every time I talk to you, like I fall in love with you again. Do you believe that because if one died for all, then every person sitting in this coffee shop, I have a song over their life. I'm literally singing right now over their life. 
And so I'm sitting there looking at, I, I know people are weirded out. I'm looking across the room and I'm crying as I'm staring at somebody. And they're trying not to make awkward eye contact with me because of how uncomfortable it is. And suddenly I began, I, I, I just began, it's like the scratch and sniff. I just began to smell the aroma of his passion for people to know him. Not because he needs more servants, but because his heart cry is that they would be free. It is for freedom's sake he set us free. And so this morning as I was saying, okay, Lord, that's a beautiful, I, man, I'm so grateful for this. I'm in awe. What do you want to do today? What do you want to do in this service? And I felt like the Lord said, will you please tell them that for some, their first love has grown cold. And I don't know who, I'm not, there, I have nobody in mind. I'm just saying, I felt like the Lord said, will you let me stir up their love again? So that's going to be our worship experience. And the way that we stir up that worship experience is this, right? Paul says you stir up the gifts that have been deposited into you by the laying on of hands. So what I want to do is we're just going to put our hands on our heart, okay? And I want to, and I want to frame it in that way, like in the, ancient, in the ancient world, to be blessed is to have enough to eat and drink and to have reason to celebrate. And so we're just going to sit, and I know sometimes then your hands get tired. There's freedom here. I just want to start here. And we're going to speak to our heart, and we're just going to settle in. We're going to say, Jesus, we just want to give space. Simply for the fact that you love us. And so we just speak to our heart. We speak to those places of first encounters with you that drew love, that drew out our affection. So we just speak to our heart. And we say, come alive. We speak to our heart and we say, be thawed in the name of Jesus. We speak to our heart and we say that you were created to receive love. Thank you, Jesus, that we have enough to eat and to drink. We have more than enough to eat and to drink. You are faithful to your provision. Thank you, Lord, that we have more reasons to rejoice and exalt out of a glad heart. So even now, as you're sitting with him, I want you to just begin to say, here are some reasons for I, that I can exalt you, Lord. If you want to write them down, if you want to whisper them to yourself, there's something about them coming out. We adore you, Jesus.
Equally, Lord, those places where we may feel despair and a broken spirit. I ask that your love would come and begin to fill those places. Holy Spirit, you wrote, for if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. And because you wrote it, it's an invitation for us. And so I invite that place within our heart to be beside itself, to be in rapture, to be in bliss with you. saying you were made for me and I was made for you. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that our paradigm would shift and that this would become salvation. This would become what being saved is. Spirit, I don't want to transition too fast. So if there's anything else you want to say, I just want to create space right now. Jesus, I just want to stay in that place with you. Our hearts are connected and there is a free flow happening. Nothing else matters. I want to speak to our minds and say, this is the place that creativity flows. This is the place that we have answers to problems. This is the place where he makes all things new.
Jesus, you're so good. You're so good. Continue to soften our heart, Lord. Yeah. I pray specifically right now for those that are wrestling through trust issues. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would empower us to open up our hands. would trust you in a deeper way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Holy Spirit, thank you. Speak life and peace and hope and rest in the name of Jesus. Yeah. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, we're going to do something a little different to start us off. <clears throat> in part, because I know... You guys don't want to hear me talk for an hour and a half. Um, but I'm going to have Abby come up. She's got some things to share about uh, just the journey she's in, or her and Danny are in. And then we're going to uh, get to rally and pray for Abby and Danny. And so, but I'm excited because uh, the Lord is just good. And He takes us all, right? If one of our values is the journey, then we get to be step-by-step uh, step with people on the journey. So, yeah, come on up, Abby. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hello, hello. Hello. Hey, guys. Hello, hello, hello. Shabbat. 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 <laughs> um, so just wanted to talk a little bit about, about kind of what the Lord has been yeah. doing uh, in my life and in Danny's life, too, since we are one. <laughs> um, so as you guys know, uh, most of you know, the Lord asked me to lay down leading worship it's almost eight months ago now, um, back in June, actually. It's actually, I wasn't attending church in that month because when COVID happened, I don't think any of us knew what to expect and there was a lot of fear surrounding it. Um, and so I wasn't at church for a little bit as I was, uh, I was actually caring for COVID patients on an ICU. Um, in Indianapolis, and I actually really loved that. It was some beautiful, beautiful moments, but he asked me to lay it down, and if you told me in June I would still not be leading worship, I would have laughed in your face and said, yeah, right, <laughs> you dumb donkey. <laughs> but here we are. Um, so first of all, I just, I want to thank you guys. Um, my heart is with you, and I know that your heart is with me. And I want to thank you for um, releasing so much grace and freedom over me to be able to be obedient to what the Lord was asking me to do and has been asking me to do in this season. So I just want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for um, journeying with us as we have been in this crazy transition. Um, so thank you. Um, first, it felt okay um, and then as we started to go into silence and different, ex, um, different sort of alternative, I'll call them worship experience, worship experiences, um, first the silence felt, it, it, like we did a couple and I was like, cool, this is different. And then as it went on, I was like, this is really hard. <laughs> I'm not used to being in silence and solitude 
um, really by myself and not used to doing that with a group of people. And so I, I noticed myself becoming um, uncomfortable sometimes, irritable sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not an easy, easy thing to journey into that if you're not used to that. I was used to being at a piano and screaming my head off for Jesus and making a lot of noise for the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with that. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, so yeah, going into silence, it's, it was, uh, it was difficult, but the Lord, like he, he continually shows me, um, as he, as we interact with him, uh, and he sort of pulls back a little, uh, and it seems like he's not interacting with us in the same way. And we kind of want him to be a formula and do the same things over and over again as we perform our things and he performs his things, right? This equals this. Well, that's not what he does. And so it, he, it's just this beautiful invitation um, into, into interacting with him in new ways. And so these really interesting and fun and beautiful worship experiences, that's kind of what those have been for me, where it's um, inviting me into wonder in a new way that I would not have experienced otherwise. So I just think that's really beautiful. Um, so... The Lord showed me a picture. Sometimes uh, during the journey, we go through cold, dark places, and we're like, Lord, where are you? And that's kind of the place that I've been. I've been, um, the Lord's been journeying with me, navigating through different levels of disappointment and heartbreak, and um, just unknowing, like, I feel like I'm in the dark and I can't even see. Usually you can see, like, one step ahead. I feel like I can't even see that. And he showed me um, a picture of a flower bulb. You know, those beautiful bulbs for any of you non-flower people, you plant them in the spring before the ground freezes. And actually they have to be in dark and they have to be in the cold. Um, and for 11 months out of the year, they're in the dark, in the cold. And there's only one month out of the year that they actually bloom and make this beautiful display. Of, of a show that's just so delightful. It's like, oh, it's so beautiful. It's so amazing. And um, even after it blooms and does this beautiful display, it, it dies. And as much as you want to go and cut the dead bloom off, you're actually not supposed to. You're supposed to let the dead bloom completely die. And it's ugly in your yard. But you have to let it do it because the bloom dies, goes all the way down, and goes back into the bulb to feed it. And that's really, really important. Otherwise, it won't refeed the bulb, and the bulb may not bloom again, or it may not bloom as beautiful. So this is a picture of my life right now. <laughs> Welcome to the party. <laughs> Come and die with me. <laughs> so I just thought that's such a beautiful picture that he, he gave me. And the thing about our culture is that it, the culture says that what you produce equals your value. Not only that, is that you constantly have to be producing. And that is not how this life goes. That is not how nature works. That's not how humans are meant to work. But sometimes we, I've believed the lie that that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So I have been a very busy lady for most of my life, filling my time doing things, being a human doing instead of a human being. So um, one of the things that really spoke to my heart during this season is when Matt was doing the Psalm 23 devotionals. <laughs> Um, that's when I was actually on the COVID ICU where I was, saw a lot of miracles actually on the COVID ICU, which was brilliant. And I also saw a lot of people get their healing by transitioning into heaven. And one of the things I'd always speak over my patients who were intubated, sedated, they were, you know, I, I believe that they can still hear and their spirit could hear. So um, I printed out Psalm 23 and I put it in every patient's room. And every time I go into that room, I read it over them. And the thing that the Lord is like speaking to my heart now is he stops me really early in it now. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down. And that's where I'm at right now. He's making me lie down. And the thing is sometimes he asks you to lie down. And sometimes he orchestrates your environment and your experience to facilitate the lying down. And so that's sort of where I'm at right now um, in my life. And I feel like the Lord is, he's teaching me um, how to journey through um, 
difficult seasons, one of the things I will just briefly share that Danny and I have been going through is uh, um, navigating infertility. Um, we've been trying to have a baby for a while now, and um, this has been a huge, huge um, uh, heartbreaking challenge that I, I, I've, no friends that have gone through it, but I've never gone through it personally, and um, wow, how vulnerable do you have to be to go and um, say, well, something's not working. We're not able to do what everyone else can do. <laughs> so there must be something wrong with us. Um, so that's been a really challenging part of this season as well, is navigating that. And um, we are still very hopeful and seeing doctors and all that stuff. Long story short, it's that's where we're at with that. And so I feel like the Lord is teaching me um, how to walk with him through disappointment and through heartbreak. And he's teaching me how to grieve and he's teaching me how to cry. And that those are all a huge part of our lives um, as we journey with him. So, yeah, I don't know what else to say. Take February off and really just be. Um, Abby has been here since I've been here. So she, my first Sunday was her first Sunday. And she has been carrying, uh, and you guys know this, you guys have been recipients of it. She's been carrying, building, sowing into the atmosphere of what does it look like to explore the heavenly realms together. Um, and she is one of the best I've ever met at it. Uh, um, in part because of her anointing, but also in part because of what you saw here is her vulnerability and her willingness to like pull back the curtain and say, I don't want anything but him. And so that being said, she's going to take the month of February off and we're, uh, you know, when like the Lord has you in a process and we're holding things. Um, and so then as, as they, her and Danny come back, um, we're going to, yeah, we'll see, like, they were wonderful and, like, they've been doing this deep dive into sound, which is not my anointing. And so, but, and it's, it's one of those things that they're learning it uh, in deep, deep ways. So, this is what I, what we wanted to, you want to add anything to that? Oh. Hi. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I totally, like, spaced the part about me taking a break. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was focusing on the important parts. <laughs> I, I do think it is important to rest and to take a break. And um, my role here has changed so much that sometimes uh, when you feel a grace lifting, you have to step outside of it so that you can find the grace again with the Lord. And my heart is with you. And I love you guys. Um, and I do still feel called to lead worship in some way. I just don't I don't have that for right now for you guys. And I know that like mu music is a huge part. I've never been a part of a church that I've seen lay down musical worship and keep meeting and keep showing up. Yeah. You guys, that is amazing. I literally have never been a part of anything like this before or witnessed it from afar. Yeah. So um, yeah, taking the break is really just me trying to uh, go into oneness with Jesus, me and Danny. And what's amazing is, uh, at my other job, the nursing job, something we had a new scheduling system. Something went wonky, and everyone's schedules got erased. And when they got put back in, I got like almost two weeks off in February. <laughs> so I'm actually going to be able to rest from both um, my jobs. So I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So what we're going to do? <clears throat> two, two things. One, uh, we are actually. At I'm going to pray, and we're going to cover them as a community. If you get a specific word for them, I want you to find, we have note cards around here somewhere, I want you to find a piece of paper, I want you to write that word down for them, okay? Sometimes there's a grace for us to grab the mics and we're just going to group pray. I, I don't feel that right now. I feel like we're supposed to write that down because it's something that in the month of February as the time as all of the, like what we're doing this morning shifts, then they can just sit with it and be with it with the Lord. Does that make sense? And so, but I'm going to pray a covering. And if you would, uh, this is the fun thing, is that um, we believe, uh, we believe that when Abby and Danny go to take a break in February, it's not just Abby and Danny taking a break. It's us covering them and like literally depositing into them 
And we may not have language or earthly language, like, like English for it, but from our spirit to their spirit, we are saying, yes, amen, we believe that this is what God has for you, okay? And so, Danny, would you, I, I don't know if you're, would you come up here? I just feel like I'm supposed to lay hands and we're supposed to just bless you guys to get everything Jesus has. As we were praying in pre-service, I heard the Lord say, I want to give them everything that the enemy has taken. I want to give them sevenfold. And that I want to multiply sevenfold everything that I have for them. And so if you would, if you want, you can extend your hands. I'm just going to stand right here. Yes. Yes. Is that okay? Can I touch you, Danny? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> this is proper techniques for teaching. You got to ask if you can touch somebody before you start to pray for them. <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I declare the banner over them is love. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Papa, from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. I just declare peace, rest, and wholeness. We, sp we speak to this season of being made to lie down in green pastures, being led beside the still waters. We speak the rest of that psalm, that portion of the psalm that says, He restores their souls. And so we as a community come into agreement that you are restoring you are redeeming, you are reviving, you are rejuvenating, you are resurrecting everything that the enemy has tried to steal. We speak that resurrection life in the name of Jesus. We speak to those places in each of their soul that they have carried the disappointment, the heartache, all of that, Lord. And we just declare that this is the season for it to come forth, to be seen in a new light. That your comfort, your rest, your peace would fill them. I pray, Father, for a renewed sense of vision and purpose for their, for their, um, their oneness with you and with each other. I pray, Father, that you would strengthen the things that are already so stinking strong. You would bind up any places. I, in the name of Jesus, I see this like circular stronghold around you too. And I feel like the Lord says, you have done a beautiful job of creating a stronghold. So if the Lord, Holy Spirit, we just ask if there's any bricks that are loose that the enemy can shoot arrows in, we just ask that you'd put those bricks back in the name of Jesus. Just put them back up, secure them up, and I pray for just this supernatural timeline, Lord, where, yeah, years would become days, where your healing that you would normally take years can take days in your presence. And so we as a community, we send them to get everything Jesus has for them. We bless you in the name of Jesus to receive the fullness of your inheritance as sons and daughters. Yeah. We lift off the yoke of, even the healthy yoke of leadership. We just lift it off right now. And we declare over Abby and over Danny, just be just be. We believe in you. We love you. We value who you are, not what you bring to the table for us. We surround you in love. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in the mighty, mighty name of King Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? Ugh. 
we find ourselves at a transition point in this series. We've been talking about what is Table Fellowship, and for you, um, I know most of you probably went back last night during the storm and re-listened to the first four sermons I gave on this, so I just want to say thank you for your diligence, for your dutiful, uh, studious ways. (laughs) I say that to say, um, the last couple weeks... We've been talking about the core values of really, and it's not so much like, hey, here's our core values. We want to be generous, right? That is a part of it, but we believe that generosity is a fruit of a heart that's just surrendered to him. So there's so many things that we can try and say, hey, we want to be a generous church. And, um, but what can happen is, is I can actually then like use coercion and manipulation to give you to give. Rather than just trusting, though, like when your heart's wrecked by Jesus, there ain't no amount that's too much. If he tells you to give it, it ain't, <laughs> this beyond me, right? You guys have had those moments where uh, the Lord says, I want you to give this amount of money and it freaks you out, right? And, but what happens is, is the Lord is showing you something deeper. And so we, yeah, so all of that to say, we will eventually probably do some sermons on like finances, but not in the general sense of uh, we need you to give more money. It's more like, Finance, like your finances are your soldiers and your army. And when you hear the Lord say, Give the, you need to release this many soldiers into this, we believe that those soldiers are attached to anointing and things of the kingdom shake loose when we, when we send them. Does that make sense? So I say all of that to say um, that that's not what we're doing here. Here, we're trying to say that this deep journey that we find ourselves in with the Lord, right? this deep place of just what, what the scriptures call sojourning, Hebrews 11 and 12 talk about they they walked the journey looking for a city whose builder was God, right? We have found that what's been helpful for us as we're doing, and I mean, what Abby did is a perfect example, is we say, oh, here is what Holy Spirit has led us into. He's led us into the importance of creating space, where I can slow down, I can be laid you know, by, in green pastures by still waters because I need to slow down because I'm full of my own opinions right now. And space is a way that can cut through that. Silence and solitude is a way that I go, I get all of my thoughts out. We talked multiple times, right? Brother Lawrence, uh, who wrote The Practice of the Presence of God, would say he encountered God more washing the dishes than he did in his prayer times. Because there's something about getting your hands from you know getting your hands busy that allows your spirit to wake up and say, "Talk to me, Lord." For me, I hate doing it, but cutting my grass, He meets me every time. <clears throat> so what we're trying to articulate is that if this is not the foundation, the space to prioritize His voice, then we're actually st- we're, we're playing different games. Does that make sense? The law, it's not about creating space for you to connect heart to heart. The law is about what can you produce for me. Behavior modification is I need your wildness, your sin makes me uncomfortable. I need you to behave so that I feel more comfortable. Does that make sense? Let me give the caveat. There is a place where confronting sin is a part of the journey. I'm not saying there's not, but we want to begin here. Heart connection is our priority, space for us to connect with Jesus, us to connect with the heart of the Father. Cool? Right? This is what this first portion of of 2 Corinthians 5, that's really what it's talking about. If we get in this place, this place is bliss. This place is heaven. Many of you know this. I get into this place, and I get lost in Him, and I feel so secure, confident, centered, it's not until I get around you people that I feel insecure. Problem's not me, it's you, right? It's all those people out there, and I hear people devolve to a place of like, I just, I like animals, I don't like people. So there's a measure of value, I guess, in that, which I, I like animals too. But at the core, perhaps it's because there's been some social wounds that we need to get healed up. And social wounds only get healed by a social balm. So this is the whole point, right? Space will always lead itself into the journey. When I slow down enough to hear the Lord's voice, inevitably he says things I don't want him to say. 
Inevitably, he begins to show me things that we have labeled my shadow. There's a thousand different languages. This is the sanctification process. This is, oh, I don't look like Jesus as much as I want to. So when you have a value for, like this is, so once again, the caveat to the, or not the caveat, but the, the layering to this is so often we can preach, you need to be humble. Pride is the great sin. There's an element of truth to that. I have never become more humble by trying to be humble. I get more prideful in my self-righteousness, <laughs> right? So this is the reality. To a prideful heart, Moses saying he's the most humble man on the face of the earth looks like arrogance. But when I've been in the presence of glory, when I've seen his face, when I mean, I, I've been undone in awe of him, I see myself in a different way. It's, it's, it's this paradox. I'm actually more confident in who he made me to be and less convinced that it's up to me. I'm more confident and equally more dependent on him. I don't know how that works. And then all of a sudden I read Moses say, and Moses was the, he literally wrote, and Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. And I go, and I get that. It's the great philosophers of all time that said, the more I get, the closer I get to truth, the more I realize I don't know. That's the journey, right? So what we're saying here is we value the journey to be present with somebody. So in this, you ready? 2 Corinthians 5. Let's go here. I'm going to walk through this because we're going to build to this today. 2 Corinthians 5. For if, verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. Right? Verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us. That's the whole journey, is letting the Lord touch those places in your heart where even the shadow places were like, the Lord's not the one that's compelling you. But as he speaks to that place, and as he, this is the crazy thing, as he loves you right in the middle of it, something shifts, it breaks loose. I don't know how to describe it other than it's the most glorious experience ever. For me, much in my life, I had anger and rage boiling just below the surface. I know none of you have that experience. But I was like at 211 degrees. And at 212, something boils. And so it was the smallest of things that could make me go off to the point that when I was younger, I had a buddy that broke my parents' fly swatter. And I jumped across the couch throwing punches at him because of how angry he made me that he would dare to break something in my family's house. Stupid, but it's 211 to 212. You know what I mean? And it's that place that as the Lord has just sat with me in it, and if I'm being honest, he let me make the messes, and then I had to clean them up. Right? Come on. Let me make a lot of messes, and then I had to repent to him, because he'd be like, son, we don't do that. I know. And I was like, well, maybe you won't make me repent to them this time. And he giggles and says, no, you need to go clean up your mess. It's the love of Christ that compels us because we believe that if Christ died for all, then all died. That if my shadow is under his grace, his heart is that my shadow would carry his glory in such a way that it would heal But I love Paul's language here that it's, it's about getting lost in the love of Christ first. It's the love of Christ that motivates, moves, directs, and compels us. Verse 15 it says, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So as Jesus hung on the cross, what I'm recognizing is that many times when we talk about the table, the, ta the table's a metaphor, right? The table's a metaphor. It can be anything that separates us. In the, in the Hebraic understanding, the table fellowship became the place of saying, no, we're in, you're out. It can be my theology. No, I have the writer of theology. I'm in, you're out. 
It can be behavior. You're not behaving in the right way. We're in, you're out. Anything that draws the distinction, this is Ephesians 2, the middle wall of separation has been torn down. That if Christ died for all, then literally he died for the shadow to be redeemed. And so there's already, from eternity on, a song been playing. Jesus heard the song and was able to say, yeah, absolutely, I'm coming in and I'm going to make that song become a reality. I'm going to give people access to that song. The places of belief systems that had separated them from God. They believed that God no longer whatever. I'm separate from God. I've done it wrong. I've got to get myself back to Him. I'm going to die that 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 mindset of sin will be dealt with. But for many of us, we're demanding that their behavior come into check when they're not even hearing the song over their life. Does that make sense? Once again, I want to bring the balance. I'm not saying their sin isn't a problem. But I have to understand accurately, their sin is robbing them of their capacity to hear the love of the Father set them free. So my job isn't to emphasize the sin, it's to hear the song over their life and a heart connection that they can, they can maybe possibly receive it. Isn't that what Paul's saying? For if we're beside ourselves, it's for God. If we're of sound mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge this, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. It's not about me getting what I want. It's not about me getting, getting to see what I want to see. It is becoming so convinced of the love of God for me that I'm saying, Jesus, what's your heart cry for this? For this person sitting in front of me. And it's easy for me to say right now, it's way more difficult when I get in the place where I feel disconnected from the heart of the Father. When I'm in a journey of darkness and the Lord says, I don't want you to do anything in ministry right now. I want you to sit down and let me love your heart in a deeper way. Because isn't that like the two steps? It's like we hear the Lord's voice in the secret place. And then you know what he does? He gives us a group of people to live it out in, in the real world. Where it's not always received and I feel oh, this is clunky and this is weird. And then you know what he does? Come back to the secret place. I want to take it deeper. And I go, no, 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 no. I've gotten really good at ministering here. I'm really good. This makes me feel valuable. And he says, well, then you're going to freeze there. Because my fire's moving, son. <sighs> okay, I'll come back in. That's the journey. And the deeper we go in the journey, you know what happens? He keeps convincing us that he likes what he made. He keeps convincing us that Jesus' death was sufficient for you to get your world rocked by love. It was capable of it. It did it. So every time I get frozen in this place in the journey where it's like, there's no hope, I'm lost. You know what I need? I need an evangelist to come get me saved again. I'm serious. I need to get saved again. Because we were saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. And every time I get saved, you know what happens? I become more convinced that the Lord doesn't think it's a party unless I'm there. Come on, some of y'all need to hear that. The Lord is not convinced it's a party unless everything that's been touched by him shows up in you. Where you are fully present with yourself, with him, and then you get to be the gift to those around you. Not because you're the wisest, the smartest, the best looking. That's already filled by my wife. See that? Good man. Thank you. I ain't no dummy. I ain't no dummy up here preaching. <laughs> Wise man. You get what I'm saying though? It's this place, and if we're really being honest, it's the place of insecurity in me that says, well, I've already arrived. Come to me, all you are hungry, and I will give you revelation that's going to blow your minds. I have it all figured out. And it was funny, I was talking with Brenda a couple weeks ago, and she asked a question, and she said, well, do, like, what about our journeys that the Lord's really healed us in? I thought, that's a great question, Brenda. Yes, we need that. Right? I know all of us in here are like 
spry chickens. We're like young and ready to run. Okay? But if, if the Lord were to bring in some like really young people, that's where your story carries anointing and weight. In a moment when you're sitting with somebody and the Lord says, tell that part of your story. If you haven't done the journey to like be confident to show up, you won't tell the story. Do you get what I'm saying? If the Lord hasn't touched that place, you'll tell the story out of a principle and not out of this tenderness of heart. Okay, I'm preaching. Hallelujah, hallelujah. (laughs) So here's the place. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and he rose again. All of the places, the table became a place where I could justify. I could justify our separation. My being better than you, I could justify it. And I could find a scripture, I could find a theology to justify exactly what I wanted to say. This verse eradicates, it rips out. What Jesus did was ripped out anything that could define you apart from your dependence on him. All of the reference points of our lives that are not touched by his love are irrelevant. And all of the reference points of my life that are touched by his love cease to become weapons against people. Does that make sense? I'll say it again. All of the places of my talents and gifts that can distinguish me and make me better, outside of the love, and I'm talking about the active love right now of Jesus, they become irrelevant. irrelevant. There's no other definitions that define you outside of the beloved. That's it. That's it. If there are any other reference points, I'm American, I'm white, I'm Christian, I'm any of those reference points, if they're used to distinguish you, will eventually become places of separation and not places of oneness. Can can we pause? This can be a hard word because our whole lives we've been taught A, we have to distinguish ourselves and what you believe is what distinguishes you. And belief systems became belonging systems. And it feels like the Lord's flipping that on his head. And he's saying, no, if you can hear the song over someone's life, you can actually speak to that place where they already belong. Because if one died for all, then all died. Come on. Does that mess with stuff a little bit? It messes with me. So then he goes on. We okay? I told the staff, I said, my, my danger is always I'm going to nerd out too much. And I'm going to lose them. And when I lose them, we like bounce from our heart to our head. Does that make sense? And so if you do that, just stop listening to me. Stay in your heart. Stay with Jesus where your heart's at, okay? It's not about you catching everything I'm saying. Verse 16, so what happens when we get saved? What happens when the Lord warms our heart? Verse 16, therefore, right? So this is what Paul's saying. We're in that blissed state. I'm actually gonna sober up so I can talk to you about who God is. But man, he is, we're drinking from the faucet with him. Come on. So therefore, from now on, we regard no one. Does it say we regard no Christian? We regard no person that's smarter than us? We regard no one according to the flesh. He's talking to this audience in Corinth and he says, even though some of you, you may have known Christ in the the flesh. What does he mean by that? You may have known Christ as the Messiah, as uh, as a miracle worker, as all of these different things. You may have known him in that way, but you know what happened? When you see him seated at the right hand of the Father clothed in glory, none of those earthly definitions matter. Because you realize that all of the things I was trying to define Christ as, they're shadows of who he is. Does that make sense? They're shadows. So we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. This is radical. That what Jesus' death redeemed in every single person, it brings closure for any reasons or judgments they have about themselves. 
So let me, let me make it practical. So there's a place where you can sit with somebody at a coffee shop, right? Insert coffee shop slash bar slash bistro slash Panera, whatever you want, right? For some of us, it's like, I love to go have a beer with somebody because it literally violates so many things in them. And I don't mean to be dishonoring in that, but it's hard to have our church lenses on when we're having a, a drink. Does that make sense? I don't know why I said that. I just did because I felt like I was supposed to. So there we go. That's for, grenade. Have fun. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, help me. So I'm sitting with somebody, right? And they're participating in uh, various levels of what we would call sin. Various levels of like um, uh, defining all of the places where they're outside of the camp. Does this make sense? And in those moments, those are really tender moments because the minute, um, and I don't mean this wrong, like is there a part of God's heart that wants to correct that? Sure. I can just tell you from my experience, Jesus never goes about it that way. Never. When I'm in the midst of that, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, the Lord is like, so what's going on? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And there's like the big elephant in the room, right? What's going on? Nothing. I won't look at it if you won't. You know what I mean? And Jesus' whole point is like, I'm not ignoring that. But you know what? That's attached to something going on in your heart right now. And when you sit across the table from somebody and you begin to hear their story, you actually begin to create space for them to come out. And you begin to actually say, oh, you're in the middle of a journey. Tell me about your journey right now. You know what you invite without them knowing it? You invite this part of them to show up that's never shown up with another person that's a believer in a church setting. Does that make sense? And so as you're sitting there, you know what happens? Is you're going, I get it. You could be a mass murderer. There's a song over your life that we've missed along the way. So can I just hear that? Can I hear that? And you know what? Inevitably, every time for all, because this is the other thing. I know some of us are more justice oriented and we're like, no, it's the, right, it's the righteousness of God. I get it. I get it. You know what happens inevitably? I have never been in a relationship with somebody in the midst of their sin that has not ultimately come out. If they kept their heart open and I stayed connected with them, I have always seen them end up coming back and repenting of their sin. Always. Right? Because the, God's concerned about this, but it's never from the place of you need to repent to make yourself right with God. It's always from a place, I had no idea he was that good. I had no idea that that was the song he was singing over me. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry that I believed the lie of a different song. We regard no one according to the flesh. Right? Verse 17, therefore... This is so fun, right? Because he connects this. Therefore, here, right? It connects to verse 16. So many times what we've done in the church, you guys ready for this? Here's one more nerdy section. My translation says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. And what we've done is when we isolate verse 17 out of its natural habitat, we make it a conditional clause. What I mean by that is we read into the text Paul saying, therefore, if you have done it right and accepted Christ. Does that make sense? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. But you know what's funny? The therefore at the beginning of that sentence actually connects it to the previous section. It's not a conditional clause. It, what it is, it's a conclusion clause. So Paul's summing up his language saying, okay, therefore, ready? Ready? If slash since we are in Christ. Since, ready? All of humanity is in the death of Christ. Since it was Jesus' death that literally released the song of heaven over every human heart on the face of the earth. It doesn't matter where they're at in their sin. The song is over their life. The song is there. It just hasn't been heard. It's on a different frequency. Since, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And you know what it does? It's, it's, it's controversial because it requires us to say, 
that Jesus' death was sufficient. It was sufficient. He's singing the song. It's there. The question becomes, has their heart been resurrected by love? Because I hear this song, just like we started today. Lord, stir up my heart in love. And if I'm being totally transparent, you know how many times? I know, I know the beginnings. I can start to hear the melody of the song over my life. Do you know how many times, though? I step away from the fire, whatever analogy we want to use. I quit going in the journey. I stay here because I've gotten really good at this form of healing and ministry, and now I can look like the expert. And so I stay in this place because I really like being the one in control and being certain. I like people coming to me. And you know what happens? My heart begins to dull. It begins to freeze up again. Where all of a sudden, salvation and me getting the fullness of the new creation he's created me to be, I'll get that one day in heaven because there's no hope here. And I would never use that language because that's bad theology. And my, I need to be certain. I need to be the expert in this. This is the Pharisees. And I'll say it again. Matt Williams is two stop signs from becoming the worst of the worst Pharisee. I'm two stop signs of hardening my heart and not being tender. Does that make sense? Hallelujah, hallelujah. If anyone was in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus isn't revealing a potential you. I need to say that again. Jesus is not revealing some potential you. He's literally seeing what is already in you. He is seeing the finished work that along the way, hear me, along this journey, you were born into a family that had its own fun traits. You were born in America, which has its own fun traits. You were born, you're living in the Midwest, has its own fun traits. There's regional, specific principalities and powers that you're navigating. There's a thousand things going on. Does this make sense? And so our journey is about letting the Lord love us in a way that the paradigms that we have created to help shape how we approach life, they get lifted off and we see with new eyes. Okay, I can feel it. I'm nerding out a lot. We okay on this? If we need to talk about the theology of this, because I know I'm gonna, you can get some angry emails on this. So, so Jesus is, what I'm saying is, is Jesus isn't revealing a potential you if you'll only do his self-help class. He's revealing what's in there already. Ready? He's convinced of the image that he saw in you before he was incarnated. He's convinced of the image he saw in you before he was beaten. He's convinced of the image he saw in you before he hung on the cross. He saw you. He saw the fullness of you. And it was you that was the joy set before him that said, this is worth my life. He saw that the sin that so easily entangles you is the very thing that distracts you from who you actually are. And it is only in the quiet intimacy of oneness with the Lord that you get reminded of the song he's been singing over your life. That, that is salvation. To be reminded of what he's seen from before creation even began. Okay. Last but not least. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Verse 18. So salvation is that place <clears throat> where my heart's been warmed and it stays warmed. It changes me because now I'm not allowed to see myself or anybody else in the same way I always have. Right? We tracking so far? So now the tender heart of God asks, will you carry this revelation into a lost and broken world. Make sense? 
So what Paul says in verse 18, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. So our invitation is about seeing people. Space and journey, they really become about us becoming the very thing that he's always seen in us. He's already, the Father, Jesus, they're already convinced of it. We create space and we say yes to his leading, we yield to his leaning because they're already convinced of what they see. They're already convinced of what they're producing in us. Right? And, and the more that I give space and the more that I journey, the more that showing up happens organically and naturally. Here's the pause though. Hard, oh, this is like a, two different things. This is the salvation journey. Is that fair? This is you becoming who you were, you were made to be. And then what happens is that as, that, as, the, as you are fully immersed in this journey, the Lord begins to say, I need you to hear me. It's not about I believe something, now I'm in the game. It's like, no, 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 I'm in the game and now as I'm walking out this game, as I'm walking out this journey, there are moments of divine encounter where I get to be a participant in somebody else jumping into their own journey. Does that make sense? It's not about you doing ministry. It's about you being the beloved of the Father and the Lord orchestrating moments of face-to-face -face encounters where through you they see the eyes of Jesus. That is what ministry is. The minute I go and I step out of my own journey, I stop going towards the fire, is the minute I will begin to try and minister you into heaven and not into the heart of the Father. I'll minister you into an idea and not into an encounter with a beloved that melts you. I'll, in, I'll, I'll literally minister you into a set of principles and the danger is they make you twice the son of hell that I am. Does that make sense? Hallelujah, hallelujah, I'm preaching. So this next part, we've, this is like the transition moment. Week four, we value what we're going to call soul hospitality. Make sense? Clear as mud. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Peggy, no comments. I saw you said last week, I'm not even there, and he makes fun of me. <laughs> ah, come on, come on, come on. Perfect. Okay, Peggy. <laughs> I had to do something. I know. That's fair. That's only fair. Soul hospitality. You have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Right? I'll say it again. The minute we step off the tracks and just try to have the ministry of reconciliation without verses 12 through 17, which is the ministry of getting wrecked in his love. Does that make sense? So your first ministry is your ministry to him and his presence. It's your ministry to your first ministry, the first thing you've been entrusted with from the moment of your conception is the, is the uh, atmosphere of your own heart. That's it. That's all you actually have control over. And if we're really being honest, you don't even have control over that. You can do your best to steward it, but man, it's an ongoing, vibrant relationship with the one who knows you better than you know yourself. And as I keep my heart tender to his voice, man, I just want to be with him. You know what happens? I don't mean for it to. The glory begins to shine. And suddenly the shadows start to get less and less. And suddenly the little bit of shadow I may have, it actually carries his presence in such a way that it can heal somebody else that I get near. Amen. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, ready? That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Jesus is not convincing an angry dad not to throw lightning bolts. This is not a bipolar God. 
I'm telling you, it's not. But how many times is that what theology teaches? They all, it's the Father's ticked at you and Jesus, like he has to come in and like stand in between. I get what we're doing. But then what do you do when you go and you sit with the Father? And man, he tells you how much he loves you and that he's always loved you. Before you were a believer, he adored you. What? No, I was in rebellion. I know. There were some lies that you believed, wasn't it? Yeah, you got the spirit of stupid jumped on you. Right? Right? And if you'd, have, if you'd have told me that in the moment, I'd have punched you. He's like, I know. That's why I didn't tell you. I just, I trusted my love. I trusted that it would thaw your heart out and you would see. And so it's this whole thing of like, God was, right? God was on the cross reconciling the world back to himself. And when we say reconciling the world, we're not talking about like you became this, oh, yeah. I, uh, I'm give me. But we find how, how is God so kindred with Abraham? How is God so kindred with Moses that he would literally say, Moses, I'll let you stand before my face. How was God so kindred with David that he would literally let David see things that were intended to be thousands of years in the future and he let him have access to him in that moment? How does he do that if we're carrying the theology that God can't be in the presence of sin so therefore he's got to be separate? Do you understand that the separation was more in the mindset of man than it ever was in the heart of God? And so ultimately what happens is we paint a picture of the Old Testament God that was like disgusted with us and now Jesus comes and goes, he's really not that bad, just give him a chance. Right? It's a violation of the heart and the nature of God. And sometimes we can feel justified in our disgust of that sin because we're still carrying that theology with us. Well, God doesn't want to be near that. I'm not condoning the sin. But what I am saying is that Jesus wasn't trying to convince a father that we were lovable. Jesus was the father's heart on display, saying the wall of separation now has been torn down so that literally the blood of Jesus is more powerful than any lie that you grew up in your family system with. The blood of Jesus is more powerful than any theology that has kept you from his presence because of some distorted view of holiness. Jesus literally became the distorted view that we carry about the Father so that we might be one with him. That's the whole journey. is unpackaging, Jesus, you see me better than I see myself because you saw yourself better than I see you. God was on the cross reconciling the world back to himself. Can you hear? Read the book of Hosea and tell me. It is not a wounded lover going, please sit before my face so I can show you that my, my, my love is unending towards you. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses to them. And that is the ministry, the word of reconciliation that he's given to you. So can we pause? Just logically, if I don't carry in my own journey reconciliation, how am I ever going to minister it? And I don't mean that. To, there's no shame in this. But for many of us, we're trying to jump up to the second half and do ministry. And the Lord's saying, stop. I love who I made in you. You've forgotten your first love. And there's no condemnation. Come stand by the fire again. You will find that ministry will find you as your heart is on fire for him. Where suddenly there's no line between sacred and secular. 
I'll walk into a bar and I will get a word of prophecy for somebody because they need to hear that song over their life. I'll walk into the coffee shop and I can't help but cry because they need to see the tears of the Father over them. So on a very practical level, I want to speak this like soul hospitality. We're really familiar with the language of hospitality of like how a room is set up and how we welcome people into home by the decorations and the, the layout of the room. It's, a, it's an amazing science. Like I, I love picking the brain of, because some people just have this gift. And I'm like, why did you put that couch there? That's amazing. <laughs> right? Why do I feel like I just want to put my feet up on this house? Then other houses have all the same thing, but I'm like, I don't want to like move one arm because I'm, I'm afraid. I'm, like I go to a museum and I'm just afraid to move my arms. It's got a different vibe. So I'm, I'm, I, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I want to say this. We've used illustrations of a bonfire. We've used illustrations of the branches of a tree. That in that passage where it talks about a tree is known by its fruit. We've had generations that emphasized in the Greek the word fruit. Change your fruit, it'll show you're a good tree. Jesus was talking about the, the healthiness of the tree. That if your roots are clean and connected, fruit is inevitable. It's just a byproduct of you being you. So let's quit worrying about the fruit right now. Let's quit worrying about what we're doing here to prove that we love God. Let's go back and get, let's just make sure our root systems are clear. It's a healthy reset. Does that make sense? And what it does and I don't know about you, we've used this language. There's something about, like, you know, like when you're camping. So I go to a bonfire at a buddy's house, and I'm kind of like, man, eh, I'm kind of tired. I want to go home and go to bed. You know what I mean? But when we're all camping together, and the bonfire gets lit, we call it, like, there's this place of, like, the linger, where I know I'm 10 steps away from my bed, so I'm in no hurry. There's long periods where there's no agenda, and there's something about the, like, you're just in it together. Does that make sense? We call it, like, it's the linger. It's after a meal when I'm in no rush, stomach is full, my glass is full, and laughter flows easily. Where, if I'm being honest, we don't take ourselves too serious because we know that we're way more comfortable showing our rear end than we'd like to be, right? Right? As we were talking, as we were brainstorming, we were sitting with the Lord on a staff meeting. And we said, Holy Spirit, what, are, like, what is the language of what we're talking about? And he said, it's a deep feeling of safe. And what we mean by that, it's safe to be themselves, safe to share, safe to laugh or to cry, and not have one celebrated over the other. Right? The internal journey, though, for us, as we are stewarding, because that's the thing, there's always somebody, and I'm glad it's not me, that's in charge of stewarding the fire. It's usually like the dad. I think it would be Bob. Bob would be the fire guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Where Bob would be, okay, I need somebody to go get some sticks, and I'm going to, you know, he's the guy, everybody's having this great, and he's jamming that thing into the fire pit, and the ashes are going, you guys know what I'm talking about. Your dads are like, oh, yeah, that's my, <laughs> I love that. That when you become aware of how good he is, many times the Lord asks you to become the tender of the fire. Does that make sense? This internal journey for you and me as we become tenders of the fire is that people's stories, hear me on this, people and their stories, especially the ones that don't look like me, that don't sound like me, they don't jive with my worldview. Their stories are what open us up to a God who's pursuing the redeemed portion of every person's heart that sits with us. I'm going to say it in a different way. It's that sometimes it's about creating a space that someone can actually begin to put language to a portion of their story 
that allows the people around them to say, this is what God's doing. And what's amazing is when this happens with an atheist, with a Muslim, with a Buddhist, with a serial killer. I don't know, that was the first, (laughs) sorry. I was trying to think of the most evil person I could think of. Yeah. <laughs> then he's just said, and you won't know he's a serial killer. <laughs> Super creepy. <laughs> Let's reevaluate who sits at our table now. <laughs> Sorry, that's good. Hmm. Ministry of reconciliation. Jesus has done the work. I become a recipient of his love. So here's the reality is that many times what can happen is that we can focus on the physical space. We can focus on the atmosphere. We can focus on uh, the programs. We can focus on the ministry works. But if I am not carrying the reconciliation in my own journey, I don't know how to have soul hospitality. And soul hospitality will trump physical hospitality any day of the week. Here's the reality though. I'm not saying physical hospitality is not important, but I'm saying that it needs to be a manifestation of my ability to sit with Bill and just hold space for him to be in his journey. And this isn't some new agey, there's no such thing as true. That's not what I'm saying. It's It's prioritizing the truth that the Lord, like Bill's journey is sacred. Like literally, if I were to see what Jesus sees in Bill, I would want to take my shoes off. C.S. Lewis says I would be tempted to bow down and worship Bill because of the glory that he carries. And yet, the Lord says, will you sit with Bill and hold his heart? I don't know how to do that. And he's like, good, now you're trustworthy because you know you don't know how to do that. Does that make sense? But if we're being honest, tell me, just go back to this. Is that not what he does with you every time you sit with him? You sit with him and you're like, I need this prayer answered. And it almost never is connected to what he tells you. He takes you like down this like, you know, labyrinth into Narnia and you're over here. C.S. Lewis, there we go. Jesus has done the work. I become a recipient of his love. It's the love that leaves me completely undone in his presence. When I begin to become convinced that his love for me is unconditional and all my striving and all of my work and all of my effort has not earned me his love, I start to see people as if they're already caught up in his love. I start to see people and he starts to tell me how beautiful he's created them to be. And I can start using language about them that literally their eternal part of them in his image will awaken to when I start to find the language for it. Come on, if that's not ministry. And then at times, he gives me the chance to actually to put language with them that God is active in this place and I didn't know it. Let me read you this quote. This is by uh, David Benner. I just thought this was so good. You ready? <clears throat> According to the commentaries on the Torah, Abraham, the father of Judaism, he spent his days sitting at the doorway of his tent, waiting to welcome any who passed by. Hospitality always began with the provision of food and protection for travelers, but it also included a bath. I'm glad we don't do this anymore. <laughs> Right? It always began with provision of food and protection for travelers, but it almost always included a bath, supplies for the traveler's onward journey, and an escort along the road toward the next destination. Ready? That was what hospitality was. And Abraham sat by his tent and just waited for people to pass. You ready? Here's the best part. Embodying these ideals of hospitality... Abraham's solicitousness, his eagerness, would not have been limited to accommodating the stranger who arrived at the door. Ready? But he would have extended to running after the ones passing by 
to press them to accept the gift of welcome that he and his wife Sarah wished to extend. That Abraham would sit by his door and it wasn't limited to those that just came to his doorstep. He literally was sitting there and it was like he was so eager to talk about like, can I bring you into my home and can I share my heart and my life with you? Right? And at that point, proselytizing, like Abraham wasn't trying to make everybody Jewish. Abraham was just so convinced of the promise of God over his life and the faithfulness of God that he just said, can I just, I'm, hey, that guy's passing, he's close. Hey, come here, come here, come here. Can, can I sit with you? Will you have a meal with me? And he knew that the meal would lead to heart connection, which would then ultimately lead to like, I'm hearing stories about somebody's journey and I'm actually becoming in awe of who God is and who they are. I'm actually tempted to go, can I learn from you about God? And they're like, I'm a Muslim. And I'm, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a grenade. I don't even believe in this. I'm, oh, interesting. Tell me about And what you find is that the tapestry of a father that has eternally loved his creation has been pursuing people that I never thought he would pursue because they were out and I'm in. And so what happens is, is hospitality isn't just about you doing ministry to somebody else. It's about positioning your heart to be in awe again at that God is wooing this person's heart in this way. And you know what it does? It brings you all the way back to here where I start the journey again. And you know what happens? God gets bigger. Jesus' blood gets bigger than I can possibly articulate. And we're caught in awe and wonder. We okay? Okay. If you have your communion. I want to end with this. <clears throat> Verse 21. It's probably the most powerful statement on the gospel. Chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let me say it a different way. This is the divine exchange that we're talking about. He who knew no sin embraced our distortion. He appeared to be without form, which is the, like what the language of sin is. To be without your, your allotted portion or form. Sin is to live out of context with the blueprint of your design. It's to behave out of tune with God's original harmony of your life. That's what sin is. Jesus took the distorted, the distorted view of your image and he became it. This was the mystery of God's prophetic poetry that he literally was made sin he was the scapegoat of the human race. He took on the distorted image of fallen mankind. He did not become a sinner, but the official representative of humanity's sin. He was disguised in our distorted image. He was marred with our iniquities to the point that he was unrecognizable because for many of us, that's what sin has done. It has made us unrecognizable from our original form. He took our sorrows, he took our pain, he took our shame, he took it to his grave, and he birthed righteousness in us. He took our sins, and we became his innocence. It's the divine exchange that there is no shadow in my life that can supersede what his love has already done in me. It's literally not some distance I have to cross. It is already housed within me. And so on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus knowing full well what was happening. Hang on just a second. These are difficult. There we go. <laughs> I was about to just do the juice. And I was like, yeah, there's an order to this, Jesus. Okay. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. 
And he said, this is my body, broken, marred, beaten. Do this in remembrance of me. In turn, he took the cup. He gave thanks. And he said, this is my blood shed for you. For the remission of sins. This is the sign of the new covenant. That the blood he shed, it speaks a better word over you. It speaks the redeemed word the poem of God that's literally flowing up in you. In the name of Jesus, as we drink this, I want to declare, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would teach us how to yield to that. Yield to what you're, you're doing in us. That we would settle in that there's no destination to the journey apart from you. And so wherever you're at, we're there. We just say yes. He said, do this in remembrance of me. I thank you, Jesus, that you have deleted the fallen state of man on the cross you have redeemed it you have spoken a better word you are inviting us to sit at the table and hear in a different way I thank you Jesus that you <clears throat> you're seated at the right hand of the Father clothed in glory above every principality and power above it all And you're beckoning us to come and hear the words that bring revelation in life. Jesus, I just, I surrender any paradigms that makes your authority more manifest in a future reality than right now. I surrender, surrender any paradigms where I'm more convinced of your glory one day when I get to heaven than I am that it's available right now. And so I ask, Lord, that you would anchor my heart in the, in the here and the now. That we would be convinced of your love in a way that radically compels us to see your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I thank you, Lord, for space. I thank you for the journey. I thank you for your value that we would show up. And I thank you, Lord, that you are cultivating within us soul hospitality, that we would run with eagerness and ask, have you met my king? We just love you, Lord. It's in your name, amen. 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 My first Wednesday, people, I'll see you Wednesday. Second and third, we'll see you in a couple weeks. <clears throat> you have any questions, holler at me. Blessings to you. Have a great week. Uh, stay warm. I, I heard next week is supposed to be super cold. So, right, we're just pushing back on that demonic principality <laughs> in the name of Jesus. Have a good week. <laughs>